Hi, my name is Matt Hatel Masri. In today's video, we're going to be looking at OpenAI function calling with semantic kernel, C Sharp, and Entity Framework. A link to the source code is at the bottom of this slide. Prerequisites for following along is simply to have .NET 8.0 and a subscription with either Azure OpenAI or OpenAI itself. Before we get started, let's ask the question, what is Semantic Kernel? Semantic Kernel is an open source SDK that lets you easily build agents that can call your existing code. As a highly extensible SDK, you can use Semantic Kernel with models from OpenAI, Azure OpenAI, Hugging Face, and much more. So here's how it's gonna work. We will be using functions that communicate with the database and our database is SQLite. Now a request will be made to OpenAI and OpenAI will determine that our application needs to consult these functions. So it's gonna send a message to our application telling our application to get the information from our functions, which of course will go against the database. And the response goes back to OpenAI and then OpenAI sends back the final response. Let's start by building an ASP.NET application. So I'm going to enter .NET new Razor and I will add individual authentication so that it can give me support for SQLite and the output directory, I'm gonna call it EF func call SK, SK for semantic kernel. Hit enter and now let's go into that directory. I'm going to add packages. These are the packages I will need. The first one, CSV helper, I will use it to import some data from a CSV file. And of course we need the semantic kernel package and all the others are supporting packages for SQLite and entity framework. So I'm gonna take this, copy it and paste it so that we can add these packages. Let's open up our app in VS Code. Open our app settings.json. There are two important settings. One is to enable us to access the service in Azure OpenAI, and the other one is to allow us to access OpenAI services. So I'll add these settings here. The first thing is I have the switch AI service. It can either have a value of Azure for Azure OpenAI or OpenAI so that you can go directly against the OpenAI service. Now for Azure, you need this information. You need your resource name dot openai.azure.com and of course this one you need to fill out based on your own service with Azure OpenAI. The model we're using today is GPT 3.5 Turbo, and this would be the deployment that you created on Azure OpenAI. And of course, you need the key from Azure OpenAI. This is a fake key. If you're using OpenAI directly, we will be using today this GPT 3.5 Turbo model. And of course, you need to get your own key from OpenAI. Next, because I'm going to model a student class so that it creates for me a student's table in the database, I will create a new folder here, which I will call models. And in that folder, I will add a new class called student. And for the student class, I will add this code. So my student has an ID, a first name, a last name, and a school. There's also a two string method that displays the description of that column and the value. I will seed my database with some sample data and there is some sample data at this gist address. I will also include this address in the description part of this YouTube video. So navigating to that link, I will click on row here to get the row data. I'll do a copy and come into the application itself. And inside the WW root folder, I'll create a new file, call it students.csv. 
and paste this data in here. This will be used to seed our database with sample data. Next, in the application DB context class, which exists under data, I will open this and add the following code in here. I will resolve these namespaces and one here and another one here. Now, we're just declaring a DB set of student objects. In the onModelCreate method, we're going to seed the database with some data and it's going to get loaded from this method here. Now this method here, it reads the student CSV file and loads it into a list of students and returns that. In this statement here, that data will be loaded into the database. I need a helper class that can read from the app settings.json file and also another helper method that can get me an instance of the application DB context class. And this is necessary because later on we need to do these things from static methods used by Semantic Kernel. So I will go into the models folder and create a new C sharp class which I will call utils. And in this utils class, I will add the following code. Let me resolve these namespaces first. Now this method here, the get config value, it takes a setting that exists in the app settings.json and it returns its value. This method here gets me an instance of the application DB context and note that both of these methods are static methods. Let's use semantic kernel. The first thing we're going to do is to create a plugin. So I'm going to create a new folder which I will call plugins and in the plugins folder I will create a new C sharp class which I will call the student plugin. Now this student plugin class is going to contain the proprietary functions that we're going to create that will help us answer a bunch of questions pertaining to our local data. Let's see some of the questions that we want to answer. Here's some of them. Which school does Matt Tan go to? If you look at our data here, students.csv, let's search for Matt Tan. And Matt Tan goes to the School of Medicine. Here are some other similar questions that we might have. Which school has the most students? Which school has the least students? get the count of students in each school, and so on and so forth. So going back to our plugin class, let us add the functions that will help us answer these questions. This is the code that will help us to do that. Let me resolve the namespaces first. Let's look at our first method, get student details. This has an annotation that it is a kernel function and this is the description of what the function does. Get student details by first name and last name. And now we describe the arguments that this method takes. The method takes two arguments, the first name and the last name. And this is the logic for getting the data based on first name and last name. You're going to get the student's collection and query the student's collection for first name and last name. If the result is null, you'll return null. Otherwise, you have found the record and you call the toString method of the student class, which is what we did here. Remember, we have a toString method here. That's our first method. The next method is get students by school. The description is get students in a school given the school name and the argument that it takes is the school. And of course, the argument, you can provide a description for the argument and you can even give an example, like the school name example nursing. And this is the logic for obtaining the students in a school. But because it's a collection, you're going to serialize that and send it back using the JSON serializer. The next method is get school with the most or least students. The description of the method is get the school with most or least student. This takes a Boolean argument with true for most and false for least. So the argument it takes is a Boolean argument. And this is the description. Is most 
is a Boolean argument with true for most and false for least. Default is true because here we set the default to be true. And this is the logic. First, we get all the students. And then if it's most, then we order by descending and grab the first. If it's the least, we order by ascending, which is the default, and grab the first. If we get a null, then we ret return null. Otherwise, we return this information, the key, which is really the name of the school, and the count. So we would say like nursing has, let's say, 10 students. The next method is get students in a school. So the description of the method is get students grouped by school. But of course, this does not take any arguments. So we don't need to describe the argument if there is no argument. Here we get all the students and we group by school. It results in two columns. The first column is the key and the second column is the count. So we take that and we use the JSON serializer to serialize it. And it, it returns a string. So what's left for us to do is use this plugin. And for that, we're going to repurpose the index.cshtml page and its code behind cs.cshtml.cs. Let's start with the HTML page. I'm going to delete this and paste my own code. And in my own code, we're going to display the service here. And what I mean by the service is, are we using OpenAI or are we using Azure OpenAI? There will be a form that asks the user for a prompt. When the user clicks on submit, it would submit to the code behind. And we haven't done yet the code behind. And over here, I'm displaying some of the questions that I might want to ask about my students. Finally, if there is a response from OpenAI, we will display it here in a green alert box. Next, we will go to the code behind page, which is this one here. And I will replace the index model with our own code. So I'll delete that and paste this code here. Let's resolve the namespaces. So this index model constructor takes the logger and I configuration as dependency injection. This is the standard on get method. We're not going to do anything to it. But if you look at the on post method, which is the method that when the user clicks on the submit button, it comes to this method. Now this method receives a prompt and it just passes that prompt to another method called call function. And this call function, it grabs all the configurations from the app settings.json. The ones that are prefixed with AZ represent the Azure OpenAI service. The ones prefixed with OAI represent the OpenAI services. This statement here determines whether we're using OpenAI or Azure OpenAI. If we're using OpenAI, then we're going to add this service to our builder object. And this takes the OpenAI parameters for model type and API key. Otherwise, if we're using Azure OpenAI, we will add this service to the builder and of course, we will need the Azure model, which is also the Azure deployment, the endpoint and the API key. In this code, we set the logging level. So we're going to set it to minimal level and log level trace. This is where we add our plugin to the plugin collections. At this stage, if you have more than one plugin, you might have two or three or four, you can add them all here. Then we build our builder and get an instance of the kernel. Here we set our history to a blank array and we request the chat completion service. This gives us an instance of the chat completion service. We add the question or the prompt that we receive from the user to the history. Here we set the AI prompt execution settings and we set it to be auto invoke kernel functions. That means 
the system automatically invokes the functions that we have whenever the need arises. So here is where we make the request to open AI and receive a response. Get streaming chat message contents async makes the request. We pass the history, the execution settings and the kernel object. Result is the resulting message. So here we set a blank string for the full message and in this loop we actually concatenate all the messages that are received from OpenAI and we add it to the history, the full message received, and we return this message. So this message gets returned over here and we set it to the reply property that is bound, like we have two bound properties. One is the service and one is reply. And of course the service is where it is set here because here we know are we using OpenAI or Azure OpenAI. We're not done yet. Before we can look at this data, we have to populate our database with data. And of course we haven't done that. In order to do that, we need to add migrations and apply those migrations. So let's add some migrations. To do that, you can type in .NET EF migrations add, and I'm going to call it M1. And the output directory is simply data slash migrations. So hit enter here. It should create for us migrations. So we can go into the data folder and under migrations, this is the migration that it created for us. And let's just skim through this and you can see that it's going to add our sample data. Let's apply the outstanding migrations so we can see our data. We do that with .NET EF database update. Now you can see that some insert statements were applied and this means that our database is populated. Let's take a peek at our app settings.json. So coming down here, we're going to start with open AI. So we need to make sure that these settings are correct. Let us start our application with .NET watch. This is what our app looks like. So I'm going to take that first question, which is which school does Matt Tan go to and paste it in here. And yes, here it is. Matt Tan goes to the School of Medicine. Let's ask the next question, which is which school has the most students? And the school with the most students is nursing with a total of 20 students. What about the least students? The least number of students are in medicine with only five students. Get the count of students in each school. Let's see what that comes up with. Paste this. Here are the counts of students in each school. Nursing has got 20, mining 14, computing 14, business 13, and medicine 5. Now, let me switch to Azure OpenAI by going into my app settings.json and setting the keys for Azure OpenAI. Back in app settings.json, I'm going to change this to Azure so that I can go against Azure OpenAI. I'm going to ask Azure OpenAI the last four questions. In this terminal window, I'm going to hit Control R to restart the server so that I'm sure it's using Azure OpenAI. And you can see here Azure function calling because when I switched, it says Azure. Let me ask Azure how many students there are in mining and it says 15. What is the ID of Jan Fry and which school does she go to? The ID of Jan Fry is 13 and she goes to the school of mining. Let's ask this question. Which students belong to the school of business respond only in JSON format? So let's find out if it's going to give us the data back in JSON format. And sure enough, we get our data in JSON format, which is interesting. And then finally, the last question is, which students in the School of Nursing have their first name or last name start with the letter J? Let's ask that question. So it's very specific. And they are Joe Sun, Jim Tex, and Liz Jin. Her last name starts with J. I hope you found this video useful. And if you did, please give it the thumbs up. And I hope to see you in my next video.
Cheers.